Welcome to Norton Chemistry. Today we're going to be answering 2016 Depth in Chemistry for AS level. Feel free to go ahead and answer the paper or do it as I answer it. Question 1. Group 2 elements are metals that react with oxygen and water. Magnesium is oxidised when it burns in oxygen to form an ionic compound. Write the electron configuration in terms of subshells of a magnesium atom. So if we look at the periodic table, we can see that magnesium is in group 2 and it's in period 3. So when we're writing our electron configurations, we need to write in terms of subshells. And so the electron configuration of magnesium is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2. Because the outer electrons are in the 3s subshell. Explain what happens when magnesium is oxidised in terms of electron transfer. So, we need to remember our definition of oxidation, which is the loss of electrons, and the uh, inverse of that is reduction, which is the gain of electrons. The trend in the first and second ionisation energies of group 2 elements can be linked to the increase in chemical reactivity down the group. The first and second ionisation energies of calcium and strontium are given in the table. So, we can see that calcium has a higher first ionisation energy than strontium and also has a higher second ionisation energy than strontium. Write an equation including state symbols to represent the second ionisation energy of strontium. So we need to remember to include state symbols. The definition of the second ionisation energy is when one mole of electrons is removed from one mole of gaseous 1 plus ions to form one mole of gaseous 2 plus ions. So our strontium is going to have to be gaseous. And it's going to start with 1 plus ions and we're going to form 2 plus ions and an electron. Explain why the first ionisation energy of strontium is less than the first ionisation energy of calcium. Strontium is further down group 2. So electrons in strontium are removed from a higher energy shell. So strontium has a larger atomic radius, a in increased shielding, and the increase in nuclear charge is outweighed by the greater atomic radius. So it has weaker nuclear attraction to its outer shell electrons. C. A student reacts a group 2 metal, M, with water. So we've got M reacting with two moles of H2O, that's a 1 to 2 ratio, forming um, a hydroxide of M and H H2, or hydrogen gas. The student measures the volume of hydrogen gas produced. 0.162 grams of the metal produces 97 centimetres cubed of gas at room temperature and pressure. That's important because that means that the molar gas constant is 24 decimetres cubed. Draw a label diagram of the apparatus that can be used. So when we're trying to measure a volume of gas, we can use a gas syringe, which we draw like this. So we can first find the number of moles of hydrogen gas formed. And since we know that we've formed 97 centimetres cubed at room temperature and pressure, we can use the equation moles equals the volume divided by the molar gas constant, which is 24,000 centimetres cubed. And that gives us 97 centimetres cubed divided by 24,000, which gives us 0 0.004. And then we can use the molar ratios to find the moles of the metal that we used. And since it, we have one mole of hydrogen gas formed from one mole of metal, then the number of moles of metal is the same as the number of moles of hydrogen, which is 0 0.004 moles. And then we can use the moles and the mass to find the MR of the metal. So MR is going to be equal to the mass divided by the moles because our equation is moles equals mass over MR, which gives us 40.08 grams per mole. And then if you look at the periodic table, the relative atomic mass of calcium is 40.1. So that means that our group two metal is calcium. The student plans, plans to repeat the experiment using the same mass of a group 2 metal from further down the group. Predict whether the volume of hydrogen produced would be greater than, less than, or the same as the volume in the first experiment. Explain your answer. So we would form a smaller volume of hydrogen, so less than. Because if you have a 
group two metal, which is further down the group, then the the mo the atomic mass of the metal must be greater, and that means that we calculate the moles. If we increase the MR, then that will mean we have a smaller number of moles for the same mass of the metal. Since the metal is the limiting reagent, that means that if you decrease the number of moles of the metal, then you form a smaller number of moles of hydrogen, and therefore hydrogen will have a smaller volume. Question two. The graph shows the melting points of the elements in period three of the periodic table. So you can see that from sodium to uh, silicon, the melting points increase and then they decrease further across the period. Phosphorus and chlorine have simple molecular structures. More information about phosphorus and chlorine is given in the table below. So we can see that phosphorus the molecular form is P4, so for every molecule we have four phosphorus atoms. And then for chlorine it's diatomic, so we have two. Explain the differences in the melting point of phosphorus and chlorine. So if we have a look at our graph again, we can see that phosphorus has a higher uh, melting point than chlorine. And that's because both simple molecular structures, but since phosphorus has four atoms in its molecules, it has a larger number of electrons in its molecules. So it can form more London forces, which require more energy to overcome. Magnesium and silicon have different types of giant structures. Describe the bonding in magnesium and in silicon. Include the names of the particles and describe the forces between the particles in the structure. So we know magnesium is a metal, so it has a giant metallic structure. And silicon is a covalent compound. And since it has a very high melting point, we can tell that it has a giant covalent structure. So therefore the bonding in magnesium is metallic bonding and in silicon it is covalent bonding. Um, so the definition of metallic bonding is strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the delocalized outer shell electrons and the positively charged metal ions. And it has a giant metallic lattice structure and then silicon, um, the covalent bonds are strong electrostatic forces of attraction between the nuclei of the bonding atoms and the shared pair of electrons. And silicon has a giant covalent structure. Aluminium forms a sulfide, Al2S3. Al2S3 reacts with water to form aluminium hydroxide and hydrogen sulfide, H2S. Write an equation for the reaction of Al2S3 with water. So we've got a sulfide reacting with water. So um, they told us what it's going to form. So Al2S3 plus H2O forms aluminium hydroxide. So we need to use Avogadro's rule to recognize that we've got Al3 plus ions and OH minus ions. So we're going to need three of these um, OH minus ions to balance out the 3 plus charge on the Al3 plus and hydrogen sulfide and then we need to balance the equation so if we have a look at the Al2S3 we need to balance out the two aluminiums first so we need to add a large 2 to the AlOH3 and then we can, net, we can also balance out the sulfur by adding a 3 to this H2S and that leaves us with 12 hydrogen atoms and 6 oxygen atoms which you need to balance. So the best way to do that is to put a 6 in front of the H2O and that gives us a balanced equation. Question 3. Compound A is an alkene. The carbon-carbon double bond in a molecule of compound A has restricted rotation because it comprises a sigma bond and a pi bond. Describe one difference between the sigma bond and the pi bond. So there's quite a few options, but you could say that the sigma bond is between bonding atoms, whereas the pi bond is above and below the bonding atoms. You could also say that the sigma bond is end-on overlap of orbitals, whereas the pi bond is sideways overlap of orbitals. Part II. Explain why compound A does not have EZ isomers. So if we have a look at compound A, um, if you look at this carbon here, it has two of the same groups attached, so it has two CH3 groups attached, and that means that 
either ar arrangement of these CH3 groups will not give a different stereoisomer. A structural isomer of compound A has EZ isomers. Draw the structure of the Z isomer and then name this isomer. So if we look, have a look at compound A, it has five carbons. So we can make a chain of five carbons. And we want the carbon carbon double bond to be at, at position two, because that means that we can have two different groups attached to each carbon in the double bond. And we need to have the groups of highest um, carbon and gold prelog priority. So the groups with the highest um, atomic number of the first atom attached to the carbon of the double bond to be on the same side of the double bond. So that gives us a CH2, CH3 group on that side. And then to name it, we mustn't forget that it's the Z isomer. Double bond is at position two, and it's a chain of five carbons, so it's pentatoene. Compound A can be made from alcohol B by heating with an acid catalyst. So just two possible structures for alcohol B. So remembering the structure of compound A is like this. If we have a look at that, the alcohol groups must be at one of two positions which is either attached to this carbon or this carbon. When we're dehydrating it, we remove the alcohol group from one of those carbons and form a double bond. So we can just draw it uh, saturated, so no double bond anymore, and draw all our side groups and our hydrogen atoms. And then we'll have one at this position, one alcohol group at this position, and for the other compound, the alcohol group will be at this position. Compound A reacts with hydrogen bromide to form a mixture of two different organic products. Give the structure of the two possible organic products for this reaction. Outline the mechanism including the curly arrow model for the formation of one of the organic products from compound A. Explain which of the two organic products is more likely to be formed. So we're looking at a mechanism of electrophilic addition. We're reacting with hydrogen bromide. So if we draw out our starting molecules, if we look at hydrogen bromide, the bromine atom is more electronegative, so it's going to take the delta negative charge. And therefore the electrons from the double bond are going to attack the delta positive hydrogen atom. That's going to break this up, this single bond here, and then we're going to form a single bond where the double bond originally was. And our bromine, our hydrogen is going to attach to one of these carbons. I'm going to draw the major product, which has a carbocation at this carbon atom, and then our hydrogen here. And then we draw bromine bromide with a lone pair and a negative charge and we draw a curly arrow from the centre of the lone pair of electrons to the carbon atom of the carbocation and then we form the final product with the bromine at the position with the most alcohol groups attached. Identify the two possible organic products so let's just draw those out down here to make it easier. If we have a look at these two products you've got the major product here because the bromine is attached to carbon which has three alcohol groups attached whereas in this minor product over here bromine is attached to a carbon atom with only two alcohol groups attached so if we name our products we have 2-bromo 2-methylbutane and 2-bromo 3-methylbutane and then we say that the major product is 2-bromo 2-methylbutane because the major product is formed from the most stable carbocation intermediate. The most stable carbocation is the one with the most alcohol groups attached, according to Mark Kivnikov's rule. Question 4. Nitrogen forms several different oxides. N2O is a useful anaesthetic, and NO has been linked to the depletion of ozone in the stratosphere. The standard enthalpy changes of formation of N2O and NO are given in the table. Explain in terms of bond breaking and bond making why the enthalpy change of formation of NO is endothermic. So an endothermic reaction is one in which energy is taken in from the surroundings. And that means that more energy is used in bond breaking than is released in bond making. 
Draw a fully labelled N3 profile diagram to represent the N3 change of the formation of N2O. The formulae with state symbols of the reactants and products should be included as part of the diagram. You are not expected to show the activation energy for the reaction. So for an endothermic reaction, the N3 change is positive. So we're going to start at a lower level. And then we're going to move to a higher energy level. And our reactants are, so it's an enthalpy change of formation. So the reactants are the elements N2 and um, oxygen. And we're forming N2O. So we need half a mole of oxygen and one mole of nitrogen. And then we need to draw up enthalpy change. Use a ruler when you do this. And then make sure you draw an upwards arrow and label delta H and the 82 kilojoules per mole. Don't forget to put your state symbols. N2O is supplied as compressed gas in steel cylinders for use as an anaesthetic. The cylinders are stored at 20 degrees Celsius. Calculate the gas pressure in pascals in a 2.3 decimeters cubed steel cylinder containing 187 grams of N2O gas. Give your answer in standard form to three significant figures. So we're going to need to use the ideal gas equation because we don't have room temperature and pressure as our conditions. So that the ideal gas equation is PV equals NRT, which is pressure times volume is equal to the moles times the gas constant times the temperature. And we need to remember the units which we use in the ideal gas equation. So for pressure it's pascals, for volume it's meters cubed, for moles, it's also just moles. And then for temperature, it is Kelvin. So I find it easiest to just write out all of our elements of our equation that we have. And if we need to do any conversions units, then we can do that before we put it into the equation. So we have 2.32 decimeters cubed, and we need to divide that by 1,000 to get to meters cubed. To find our moles, we need to divide our mass by the MR of N2O. So we need to do 187 grams divided by... 44 grams per mole, which gives us 4.25 moles. So to convert from degree C to Kelvin, you just add 273, which gives us 293 Kelvin. And then we need to rearrange our equation to find the pressure, which is going to be the moles times the gas constant times the temperature divided by the volume, which gives us 4.25 times 8.314, which is on the data sheet, multiplied by the temperature, which is 293 Kelvin, divided by 2.32 times 10 to the minus 3 meters cubed. And that gives us 4.46 times 10 to the 6 pascals. And that's the three significant figures. NO radicals classify as the breakdown of ozone in the stratosphere. Write two equations to show how NO radicals catalyze this breakdown. So they're asking for propagation steps. And an NO radical we draw like this with a dot on the oxygen to show the unpaired electron. So in this propagation step, NO is our catalyst, so we need to regenerate it. So we're going to start with our NO radical reacting with O3 to form NO2 radicals and O2. And then NO2 radicals are then going to go on and react with O radicals to form NO radicals and O2. So we can bring it down to the overall equation O3 plus O goes to O2, 2O2, if you cancel all of these elements out. Question 5. A student investigates the reaction between strontium carbonate and dilute nitric acid. The rate of reaction is determined from the loss in mass of, over a period of time. Explain why there is a loss in mass during the reaction. So we're forming CO2, which is going to be a gas, which is going to be released. An excess of strontium carbonate, SrCO3, is mixed with 20 centimetres cubed of 1.25 mole per dm cubed nitric acid, HNO3. Calculate the mass of SrCO3 that reacts with HNO3. 
So we've got a 1 to 2 ratio of SrCO3 to HNO3. And to find our moles of HNO3, we need to multiply our concentration by our volume, which is 20 centimetres cubed, divided by 1,000 to convert to decimeters cubed, multiplied by 1.25 mole per dm cubed, and that gives us 0 0.025 moles. And then to find the moles of SrCO3, we need to divide that by 2, which gives us 0.0125 moles. And then we can use that to find the mass because we know that MR of SrCO3 is 147.6 grams. But since a three sig fig given in our question, that's the minimum number of sig fig that they've used, we give the answer of 1.85 grams to three significant figures. The student plots a graph of total mass, reagents and container against time. Describe and explain the change in the rate of reaction during the first 200 seconds of the experiment. So if we have a look at the graph, we can see that over the first 200 seconds, the rate of reaction decreases because the gradient of the graph uh, decreases. So that's because the concentration of the reactants decreases as they're used up, which leads to less frequent colli collisions. Um, so there's less collisions between reactant molecules per time period. Using the graph, calculate the rear reaction in grams per second at 200 seconds. Show you're working on the graph. So we need to draw a tangent at 200 seconds. To draw a tangent, we must um, try to draw a line at, that only touches the uh, line on, of the graph at 200 seconds, like that. And then we need to find the gradient of the tangent. So to do that, I always label where the tangent touches the x and y axis. Um, so where it's, it starts at zero, 315 seconds, and then on the y-axis, it finishes at 95.90. So that's a mistake people often make. They often assume that the bottom of the y-axis is zero. When it isn't, it's 95.9. And then at the start, it is 96.06 grams. So then to find our gradient, we need to do the change in y divided by the change in x. So that's 96.06 minus 95.90 grams divided by 315 seconds minus 0 seconds, which is 5.07 times 10 to minus 4 grams per second. So that's 5.08 times 10 to minus 4 grams per second to th three significant figures. Then part C. Outline a method that could be used to obtain the results that are plotted on the graph. Your answer should include the apparatus required and the procedure for the experiment. So we can do the reaction in a, in a beaker and we can use a balance to measure the change in mass over time. And then we can use a stopwatch to record the time period. The method is that we need to continuously record the mass at time intervals and then we could set the time interval of, say, every 15 seconds. Question six. This question is about the properties and reactions of butantuol. Some properties of butantuol are listed in the table. So why is butantuol classified as a secondary alcohol? So it's classified as a secondary alcohol because the OH group, the alcohol group, is attached to a carbon which has two carbons attached to it. The shape around the oxygen atom in butantuol is non-linear. Predict the COH bond angle and explain the shape. In COH, the central atom is oxygen, and oxygen has two lone pairs of electrons and is non-linear, so it has two bonded pairs and two lone pairs. So the bond angle, if we recall correctly, is 104.5 degrees. And the explanation for this is that O atom or oxygen atom has two bonded pairs and two lone pairs and electron pairs repel 
but we know that lo lone pairs repel more strongly than bonded pairs, so they reduce the bond angle. Because if it was just linear, and we had, say, two bonded pairs and no lone pairs, then it would be 180 degrees. But each lone pair repels the electrons more strongly and decreases the bond angle. Butan 2 ol can be oxidised by heating with an oxidising agent. Write an equation for this reaction. Use O in brackets to represent the oxidising agent and show the structure of the organic product. So when we're oxidising a secondary alcohol, we can only form one product, which is a ketone. We're going to use structural formulae to write the equation because that's the easiest way to do it. And we'll just draw out Butan 2 ol first. And then we're going to form a ketone, which is butanone and we're going to form one molecule of H2O. The student plans to carry out this oxidation using the apparatus shown in the diagram. Give one reason why the apparatus is not suitable and describe a more suitable way of carrying out this oxidation. So butan 2 ol is an alcohol, so it's very flammable. So having an open flame near it from this Bunsen is, very, is a safety hazard. So instead you would want to use a water bath. You would want to heat the reaction mixture under reflux. 20.2 grams of butantol is reacted with excess sodium bromide and sulfuric acid. So sodium bromide is NaBr and sulfuric acid is H2SO4, which we can see in the equation. And 25.2 grams of CH3, CHBr, CH2, CH3 is formed. Calculate the percentage yield of CH3, CHBr, CH2, CH3. So the formula for percentage yield, the actual number of moles of the desired product formed, divided by the theoretical number of moles of the desired product formed. To calculate our moles of butan 2 we need to do the mass divided by the MR, which is 20.2 grams over 74 grams per mole, which gives us 0.273 moles. And then we need to find the moles of our product, which is 25.2 grams divided by the MR, which is 136.9 grams per mole, which gives us 0.184 mole. Because it's a one-to-one -one ratio, we can do the actual yield, which is 0.184 moles, over the theoretical yield, which is 0.273 moles, multiplied by 100, which gives us 67.4%. So for the final question, we've got a combined techniques question. For these questions, I like to go through the question and highlight any key information which we can use on our answer. These are the only questions where the examiners get the actual question itself because there are marks available for labelling things like the spectra and other parts of the question to help your answer. So organic compound C has the following percentage composition by mass. So this information we can use to find the empirical formula. The infrared spectrum and mass spectrum of compound C are shown below. So if we have a look at the infrared spectrum, we can see that we have two major peaks outside of the fingerprint region, which are a broad OH stretch in the range of 2,500 to 3,300 centimetres, which indicates a carboxylic acid, and a carbonyl stretch in the range of 1,630 to 1,820 centimetres, which indicates a carbon double bond oxygen bond, which could be an aldehyde, a ketone, a carboxylic acid, or more carbonyls. And then if we have a look at our mass spectrum, we first want to take note of our M plus peak, which is the peak furthest to the right on the spectra, and that is at that 88 mz. And then we can also take note of our peak of largest relative intensity, which is at 43 mz. And any other peaks which we might find interesting, such as one at 27. In the mass spectrum, a secondary carbocation is responsible for the peak with the greatest relative intensity, which is the one at 43. Identify compound C. In your answer, you should make clear how your conclusion is linked to all the evidence. So you must include uh, elements in your answer of every single piece of evidence that they have given you. Um, otherwise, you will not get into the level three. So we'll start with the empirical formula. So I like to set out 
in table showing mass moles simplest and empirical so for the moles of carbon we divide 54.5 by 12 for the moles of hydrogen we divide 9.1 by 1 and for the moles of oxygen we divide 36.4 by 16 so you can see that we've got 4.54 moles of carbon 9.1 moles of hydrogen and 2.275 moles of oxygen so the fewest number of moles is the oxygen which means we need to divide by all of the moles by 2.275 moles that gives us a ratio of 2 to 4 to 1 giving an empirical form of C2H4O. We can use our M plus peak to identify our MR, which is 88 grams per mole. And then we can find the molecular formula using this information. So 12 times 2 plus 4 plus 16 gives 44. 88 divided by 44 is 2. So that means our molecular formula must be two lots of our empirical formula. So that's C4H8O2. And if we test that out, 4 times 12 plus 8 plus 32 is 88 grams per mole, which is correct. And then we need to present our evidence from the infrared spectra. So we have a peak in the range of 2,500 to 3,500 centimetres, which is an OH stretch, and a peak at 16, 1,630 to 1,820 centimetres, which is our carbon double bond oxygen. That means that C is a carboxylic acid. And then we can use our mass spec to identify groups present in our molecule. I like to set it out in a table showing the MZ of each fragment and the fragment R. Make sure you reference the peak at 43 because they mentioned it in the question and you must evaluate all of the evidence. So the peak at 43 is going to be a fragment iron of C3H7+. And if we look back at the evidence in the question, it says that it is formed from a secondary carbocation. So to have C3H7 plus present, it must be in the form CH3, C plus H, CH3 that carbocation. Therefore, compound C has a structure. Thanks for watching. I hope the video helped. Be sure to check out my website. I've got lots of resources available for purchase, including my A-level chemistry notes and my A-level chemistry flashcards, of which they're 899. You can also send me an email to book a tutoring session. So just send me a message and I'll book you in straight away. Be sure to check out my other videos, I've got lots of exam question walkthroughs, more past paper walkthroughs and also topic specific revision videos to help you achieve A-level chemistry success.